Hi, I'm Paul Morin with the Energy Conservatory and welcome to our webinar titled Blower Door Basics. We'll cover some housekeeping items first. Uh, please type in questions as you think of them under the Q&A part and we will be responding to those during the webinar. And then we'll also take time at the end to go over those questions and any additional questions that come in. This webinar, as is all our webinars, uh, is being recorded and you'll be able to view that at a later date on our website or our YouTube channel. And we're always looking for feedback on what kind of webinars you'd like to see. So uh, please let us know on um, uh, what kind of webinars you'd like to, to see and we certainly um, a lot of the webinars we do are based on feedback we've gotten and, and um, um, ones that you're requesting. This webinar is available for one BPI continuing education unit and we'll upload that information to the BPI website and you should see that credit appear there. We won't be providing any additional completion certificates or documentation. Um, you'll just see that come up on, on the BPI, um, your BPI website. If you didn't provide us with your BPI number yet, you can still do that. Email us at editor at energyconservatory.com and include your full name and your BPI number. And you do need to be logged in under the the email address you provided us in order to get credit for it. So if two of you are watching this webinar together and one of you is logged in and one isn't, only, only the logged in one will receive credit. So just a heads up on that. So our agenda today, we'll start out with uh, the system components, uh, what's included in a blower door kit, um, how to set up the house for a test, how to set up the blower door for a test, um, conducting, a depressurization test, conducting a pressurization test, why you might want to do that and what's different. Um, using the TEC auto test app and then we'll review uh, test results and, and see understand what that means. Um, all the information you gain from, uh, from doing the blower door test. We'll talk about things that affect calibration of the fan and Lastly, we'll cover some methods of finding air leaks. So the system components, these are what you will receive when you, when you uh, purchase a blower door system. Um, the fan, you can see in the background there with the, uh, the A and B ring. And what we call a no-flow plate, the blanking plate. That, that's what comes with the system. The frame is in a, in a soft case and leaning up against the fan there. So all the frame parts are, are inside there. Uh, on the left side, you'll see the accessory case uh, to, to carry everything in. On the right side is the, the case for the gauge and charger um, and, and tubing that comes with the DG1000. And you can see the DG1000 there is mounted on the on the um, um, the gauge board, and it has magnets on the back side of the gauge, so the gauge board is different from our old one. And uh, speed controller is uh, is clipped onto the bottom of that. And then the tubing, the uh, red. There's 10 feet of red, 30 feet of clear, and 15 feet of green tubing and then you'll see the red nylon panel there. There are some basic uh, instructions um, that, uh, um, that come with the kit. On our website, there's more in-depth manuals and, and, um, and quick guides that, that you can get also. We do have a new blower door speed controller uh, that's pictured here. It'll have a toggle switch for, for on and off. Uh, so instead of clicking it on, it's, it's got an on off switch. Um, and also it has, uh, you can see that from the top view that it has a serial number. So um, we'll, know, we'll know how old that speed controller is. And, and there are also status codes. You can see on the, on the picture at the right, you can see a color green in there. 
um, there's some lights that will will indicate different uh, statuses. So if you're having problems with the speed controller, um, you can look look at that and and help us diagnose what what the issues might be. Other systems that are available, um, we've got a red nylon panel with a hole um, the size of our duck blaster fan, and the duck blaster fan. Um, can move up to 1,350 CFM at 50, so you can certainly test um, um, tighter units with that. If you're doing code compliance testing and, and 3R changes per hour is required in your state, you could test a house up to about 3,500 square feet. So um, it's a pretty nice to be able to, <laughs> you know, if you're doing duct leakage testing and blow door testing in the same house to, to carry that smaller fan in. You know, you can always have the blow at our fan for when you're doing uh, larger houses or or uh, existing homes that are going to be leakier. But um, but to be able to leave that fan in the truck and just bring in the smaller fan is kind of nice. And then we do also have two and three fan uh, blow at our systems. And uh, the one pictured at the right here is the setup for that we sell for a three fan system. And it, it most people who are doing commercial testing or multiple fan testing are using software. So this is set up for, for that application where all the speed controllers are on one gauge board and we're using two DG1000s for three fans because in the software um, you can set up, so the, you know, the way this one's set up is the gauge on the left is set up like you would for a regular blow dart test with the lower fan. So the lower fan flow and the outdoor uh, reference pressure and um, then the middle fan uh, and the upper fan are um, you can read out from the gauge on the right because the software allows you to set it up that way so next we'll go into setting up the house for a test certainly um, as you know close all exterior doors and windows when I was doing blow door testing, I would I would actually lock the exterior doors so they wouldn't pop open during a test and make sure the windows are locked. And that's a way of confirming that the, the windows are closed all the way. It's often hard to tell until you get right up there and lock it, whether the window's closed all the way. So that's good practice. And uh, open all interior doors. Turn off any devices that will change the, the pressure in the house. Anything capable of changing the pressure in the house, make sure that's turned off. Um, all combustion appliances um, need to be adjusted so they will not come on during the test because you are going to be pulling air down any chimneys <laughs> um, if they're uh, natural draft appliances or induced draft. Um, you'll be pulling air down chimneys during the test, so you want to make sure those appliances don't come on. Uh, make sure there's no fire in wood stoves or fireplaces. Make sure you let your um, customers know that ahead of time and make sure the dampers are closed. If you leave a fireplace damper open and there's ashes in the fireplace, uh, you won't do that a second time. <laughs> Unconditioned spaces. Uh, it's to make the test repeatable. It's important to make sure you're you're always treating um, things the same way. And, and some examples of that, if you have a attached garage, do you leave the overhead door opened or closed? Um, if you, most standards or protocols will, will say to close that door during that test. But if you, wanna, if you wanna test that wall between the house and the garage at 50 pascals, you, you're likely gonna need to open that door. So, you may do that for some diagnostic testing. But unconditioned uh, spaces, you know, other examples of that would be uh, unconditioned crawl space. And it's, it's good practice to open that to the outside if there's a door out there. So, um, or, or maybe open vents. Um, you should have uh, established protocols uh, uh, that you're following for how to set up those spaces. Maybe you've got a, in our, in our climate, we have um, three season porches where they might have storm windows on them and be fairly airtight. And do you open those spaces to the outside during the test? You're not gonna get a repeatable test unless you have some kind of protocol on how to set up the house for the test. Um, can anything be sealed? Um, 
the the ResNet standard or the the brief standard that's outlined for code compliance um, says the only thing that can be sealed is a continuously operating ventilation system. You can turn that off and seal it on the outside. Um, anything else. Um, you shouldn't shouldn't be sealing. For example, maybe they have a window air conditioner in there, and and uh, you know if you're doing a test before and after construction, and you, you one person seals it and another one doesn't, then then you're not getting the same results. So make sure that that you have some protocols that you're you're following to make sure that these tests are are repeatable. And before leaving the building, um, make sure and get that house back into conditions that you found it in. Make sure combustion appliances are turned back on and, um, and that the house is back to how you found it. Setting up for the blower door test. Uh, the first step here is taking the frame out of the, out of the case and getting that set up. When I did blower door tests, I had a van or an SUV and I never took the frame apart. <laughs> that saved a little bit of time, but to keep it in good shape, um, a lot of people will will pack it in and, um, and put it together. So lay it on the floor with the cam levers and the, the, um, the adjustment screws uh, facing up. And there's, you can see there's, um, there's a, some bullet connections at the end. So push down that, that, uh, round tab and, and slide it in and that'll lock in the corners. Do that with the four corners and then adjust it to fit the door opening. This is a trick that I learned from uh, Greg Nahn, a local trainer here, a uh, trainer in Wisconsin. Throw the red nylon panel over the door. You've always got a door, right? <laughs> Throw the red nylon panel over the door and then put your frame against that and then and then make the connection. So that's, I, I, I like that idea. That's a pretty slick way to do it. Um, sometimes you don't have much room on the floor to, to lay it all out and this is a quick, easy way to, to do that. And then put it in the door opening, make the adjustments to it, throw the, the uh, tighten the adjustment screws and, and throw the cam lever that gives it a little extra push in, in tightness. And, and then grab the frame by the top and, and pull on it to make sure that it's in there firmly. Um, everybody that's done a lot of blower door tests is at some point got hit in the head with a frame. So, so to avoid that, grab it by the top, uh, towards the top of the frame and, and yank it to make sure that it's, that it's in there snug. Um, then you'll throw the tube to the outside out and that green tube is about 15 feet long. So you have about five feet in the house and, and another 10 feet outside and throw it off, uh, off to the side of the fan it, it is good practice. The, when you have a rings on the fan, the, the air comes out of the fan kind of going sideways. So if, uh, so it's good to keep it a good distance away from, um, from where the fan is. Then put the fan in, uh, slide it in on the bottom first, and, and then pull the elastic around it. Um, use the Velcro strap that's on the, the crossbar, uh, wrap that around the handle, and then around the, the crossbar uh, to secure it. There is a gauge hanger bar, is what we call that little bar with a hook on the end of it. And rather than attaching um, you know, having the speed controller engage on the floor, having them on a door, it's convenient to, to just put them up, um, connect that on there, and then connect the uh, gauge board onto that. So this is the gauge board with that the DG700, DG1000 will go on to. Um, there's a clamp on the back, so you can clamp it, clamp it to that, that uh, gauge hanger board. And the speed controller is, is clipped onto the bottom of that gauge board. And then you'll plug that one end into the uh, the blower door fan, and plug the other end into the wall. Put the DG1000 on there, and and turn it on, and that will bring you to the the home screen. And on the bottom row there is the tubing assistant, so I'll touch that, and that'll help you uh, get the gauge set up real quickly. So we're gonna choose a building tightness. So the first square there, we'll choose building tightness because that's the kind of test we're doing. We will choose depressurization. 
will choose that the gauge is inside the house. The tubing connections are different if you're outside. So uh, we're inside the house and the Model 3 fan is, is the only one you'll see in the United States um, that, or, or Canada. So you'll choose that one. And, um, and then the tubing assistant helps you determine where to connect the tubing. So those of you used to the DG700, it was input reference up down. This one's input reference left right. So the A channel reference is going to the outside. The B channel input is going to the Model 3 fan. And then we'll touch the green start button on the lower right there. And that brings us to the home screen. Those colors uh, carry over to help guide you on, uh, on where the tubing goes. And then also, so this is a close-up view of that. So you'll see uh, outside's in green, Model 3 fan is in red. That's where you'll connect the tubing up. The, um, the mode is now set to flow at 50. And the device is set to Model 3 fan. The cruise is also set to 50 pascals. Um, you can see we've got the speed control slide bar here. You can click and drag that, or touch and drag that rather. Um, and then the time averaging is up on the upper left. And uh, on the channel A side, right below the 0.0, .0 is a set baseline um, for when you're setting the baseline. So now the gauge is all set up. The only thing we might need to adjust is the ring. So we'll, uh, if we touch on all of these things that have the little triangle next to them um, are active. And if you touch them, it'll bring up a, a different menu. So if we touch the open fan, it will bring up uh, our menu so we can change the ring. We can touch that to change it to ring A. So you'll notice um, we're on the configuration tab now, but the device tab and the the uh, mode tab are all on that page also. Okay, and then we connect our tubing and uh, we'll see, we can see we're, we're reading a, a baseline. So we can now touch uh, the set baseline tab there and it'll start counting up in seconds on the right. And once the number is stabilized on the left, we can hit the enter button, which is right below the, the 0 0.7 there. We can click on enter. And now uh, we can see that it subtracted the baseline and it's showing what it subtracted. It subtracted negative 1.7 here, um, took that away. The, the, the reading here will still, if there's any wind at all, it'll still move around a little bit, but it did subtract away that baseline. So what's what we're going, the number that's gonna be displayed now is how much pressure we're inducing on the house, the, the change in pressure, not, not the total pressure. Okay, so next we'll, we'll take the rings off and we'll turn the fan up to, to uh, close to 50 pascals. And we've got it in, in the flow at 50 mode, so it'll display the flow on the right side there. Using the flow rings, um, the open ring will move between 2435 and, and uh, 6300 CFM. And if, if we're seeing uh, low on, on the right side, in this case, we've got the house up to, to 50 pascals and it's reading low on the right. So what's happening is we're out of the range of, of this fan. We're less than 2435. So our pressure at the flow sensor is too low. Um, so it's the, the, the gauge is always reading a pressure. It's reading the pressure in this case at the flow sensor of the fan and it's converting it to flow based on which device you chose and which ring configuration you chose. And if that pressure at the flow sensor is below 26 pascals, then it's gonna show low and, and you need to add rings. So if we, if we switch this to, um, if we, if we switch it to, so in this case, we'll, we'll switch it to ring A, and, and now our reading at 50 pascals is about 1876, which is in the range of, of ring A, um, which is between 915 and, and 2800 CFM. 
Um, ring B will be between 300, so the low end is 300 on that. And you can see there's overlap between the, um, the highest measurement you can get and the lowest on the other ring. There's some, there's some overlap there. Um, ring C will read down to about 85 CFM. Uh, that's an optional ring, so that's the same size as the, the no flow plate. Um, so if you want to cap the fan, you have to take ring C out and put the no flow plate in place. And then we've got a ring D and E. Uh, ring D, again, is the same size as the no flow plate, so we'll go in that location. And you can see it has a brass tap next to that red dot there. It has a brass tap. And rather than, than connecting the B input to the tap on the fan by the handle, you'll connect it to the tap on the ring. So it's reading the pressure across that opening. And you notice ring D has some depth to it. It's like a top hat. And it, um, so it's, uh, it's reading the pressure across that opening. And then you can see ring E is just the little one that fits into ring D. So ring D will read down to 30 CFM, ring E down to 11. So using, when you're using the flow at 50 mode, you need to keep in mind that channel B is not showing the amount of air moving through the fan. It's not showing the airflow through the fan. It's showing what the airflow would be if you were at 50 pascals. So that's an important um, um, difference. And it won't display a flow until the pressure on channel A is above 10 pascals. So for the blower door, it needs to be above 10. For the duct blaster, it needs to be above 5 pascals. So you'll see, if you, if you ever see four dash lines on the gauge, that means you're, you're in a, a flow at mode, and it means the pressure isn't high enough on channel A for it to, to do a conversion between the flow through the fan and what the flow would be at 50. So in this case, ring B on, and we've got, we've got the fan cranked all the way up and we're only able to get up to negative 8.7 Pascal. So we're, we don't have a, a flow shown. Um, if we switch that from flow at 50 to flow, to the flow mode, now it will display the flow through the fan. So now we can see we're at 11.27 CFM at negative 8.7. Uh, pascals. So now we can see that flow. So we can tell we've got uh, way too leaky a house for ring B. In fact, we're going to need open fan. So either uh, this house isn't as tight as you thought or a door blew open or a window's open or something's going on. Side attic hatch popped open. So if we switch that now to open fan, uh, took all the rings off and, and switched the setting on the gauge to open fan. Now we can see at, at about 50 pascals, we're, we're at 34.18. So conducting a depressurization test, you can do, a, a lot of people will, will simply do a, a single point manual test. Um, if you're testing under windy conditions, it's good practice. You know, when you do baseline, you'll see the moving average on channel A and how many seconds that average has been on channel B. And, and you can leave that go for a minute or longer on, on really windy days. Until the, the rule of thumb I use is I want the number on the left is gonna get more stable as time goes on. And once that stays the same for a few seconds, then I'll push enter, then I'll enter that, that baseline in there. And what I recommend is if you leave that go for 30 seconds, then do a long-term average once you get it up to 50 for 30 seconds also. And that's a nice thing about the 1000 is it has a little counter on there that'll tell you how long it's been on long-term average and you can match you can match your baseline uh, with a CFM at 50 time averaging. Or on windy days, you know, it's not a bad idea to do a multi-point test. And if you're using either PC-based software or mobile device apps, you can do either an automated single point test or a multi-point test. And on windy days, if um, you, you can adjust the, the time average um, and have it take data for longer, longer periods of time. 
conducting a pressurization test, you might want to do a pressurization test to find air leaks. If you have a, a smoke puffer, it, it's easier to see the, the smoke travel from the smoke puffer to a leak. You know, it kind of all flows uh, towards the leak than if you're if you're depressurizing, the air is blowing in through the leak and, and the smoke kind of scatters and it's hard to, harder to find exactly where it is. Um, we used to have a standard when I was doing blow dart testing to, uh, if you're doing an inspection on, on some weatherization work that was done on um, tongue and groove paneling, for example, we would pressurize the house to 25 pascals. And if it would uh, pull smoke from, from an inch away, so we'd hold the smoke puffer an inch away, if you could see that that smoke travel from the smoke puffer to the leak, then then that was a fail, and and that that was a pretty good test. So pressurizing some people pressurize um, to to find air leaks. If you're doing a, a duct leakage outside pressurization test, then you'll be pressurizing the house and the duct work at the same time. Um, so you could be pressurizing uh, for that. Our older fans, you know, if you've got a fan that's older than 10 years old, it, it uh, will have a, a forward reverse switch on it. And you can use that reverse position if you're not measuring airflow. And in these two cases, you wouldn't be using it to measure airflow. So you could use that, that switch on the fan to, um, to pressurize the house. Um, but if you're pressurizing and measuring flow, then, um, then you can't use that forward reverse switch. And you may be doing that for IEQ reasons. If, if you go into a house and there's a real strong moldy smell and you suspect it's in the walls, you don't want to be pulling air in through, through those walls and spreading the mold spores throughout the house. Uh, protocols that you're following uh, for, for asbestos or, or vermiculite may, may require you to pressurize. Um, and some standards require both a depressurization test and a pressurization. So that, that may be the case too, where you're required to do a uh, test in both directions. Um, when you're measuring flow, you will need to turn the fan around. So you'll see the great side of the fan. Now the rings are outside. So you could do the baseline um, test with it facing in, and then and then uh, flip it around before you turn the fan on. Um, and if you follow the tubing assistant and tell it that you're doing a pressurization test, it'll it will tell you that that you do need to have a, another tube going uh, to the outside on, um, on on channel B reference. And if you can. You know, you your your kit came with a with a T connection that has two short pieces of tubing on, so you could put those short pieces of tubing on reference A, reference B, and then the tube going to the outside. Um, you can just run one tube to the outside, but that tube needs to be in the same pressure zone as the the flow sensor of the fan because what you're measuring is the pressure at the flow sensor of the fan with reference to the space the flow sensor is in. So if it's a windy day and you want to run the tube around the back side of the house and you're set up in the front side of the house, um, you, you'll need a separate tube for the channel B reference because that needs to be in the same pressure area uh, as the flow sensor. And if your outside reference is on the other side of the house, you, you, you would need um, two tubes. Um, using the auto test app, um, you can um, download that free app from your app store and um, you'll turn on your gauge, install a fan control cable and turn on the, the speed control. And you'll go to the DG1000 settings page and go to network configurations and uh, choose Wi-Fi create network. Then you'll go to your, your phone or your tablet Wi-Fi settings and um, choose your gauge. So what you'll see when you go to your, your Wi-Fi settings, you'll see everything that you can connect to there and everything that's available. And one of them will be DG1000- and then the serial number of your gauge. 
um, that'll be one of the things that can show up and you, you choose that one. So the, the DG1000 is broadcasting a Wi-Fi signal. Um, so it's got a radio in there that's broadcasting a Wi-Fi signal and you're connecting directly to that. So you don't need a router, you don't need the internet, you, it, it's sending out a signal and you're connecting directly to that. So it'll ask you for a password, like the first time you go on any router, Wi-Fi router, um, you'll need to enter the, uh, the password and the password is, is listed on that network configurations page. So the, the place where you put it into create network on the right side of that screen, it'll show you this password and that's DG1000 PW for password. So easy to remember. Um, once you enter it in once um, on your phone or your, your iPad or tablet, um, you won't have to uh, enter it again. It'll, it'll remember and it'll connect. It'll connect automatically, not possibly. Um, and then you'll, you'll launch that app that you've downloaded, the, the TEC Auto Test app and uh, and you're ready to go. So um, next we'll do a live uh, demonstration of, uh, of doing a blow dart test using that app. Okay, um, so I am going to, you can see on the lower left there is the auto test app and I'm gonna launch that. And this is what this screen will look like when you first open it up. And in the settings section, um, you can set up, um, you can enter your name and your credentials and, and your testing company and all of that information in there. Projects are, you can think of a project as a house. Um, so if, uh, each, each project listed is a house. At the bottom here, you can sort them by, by either name or date. So you can keep some of those things in mind when you're coming up with an aging, a, a naming um, regiment. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add um, a new project. So I'm going to hit the plus sign down in the corner here, lower right corner. I'm going to give it a name. call it best homes and um, for the building and cu customer information I'm gonna go to that tab next um, and I'm gonna click on determine location here I'm gonna allow it to determine my location um, so it find found where we are there and I'll click use current location and it gave me the address. So it's telling me what it thinks is the address and that's the right address. So I'm gonna click use this address. And now, now you can see it put the geotag for the longitude, latitude, and the altitude. Brought the altitude in, gave it a timestamp. So now I know where I was, what the altitude was, and what time I did that. And now it just populated the information in my report. So up on the upper left, I'm going to go back to building and, and uh, customer information, and it populated um, that address. So that's the address of this location. And I'm going to copy that information. If you're doing um, work for a particular homeowner, you can copy that building address, and I'm going to do that. Um, copy that address information um, down into the information below and I'm gonna give this company, um, this customer is best, let me give um, that customer a name. Best Homes. Um, and then, you know, if I'm gonna do work for that builder again, um, that information will be in there and then I can use the geotag to find, find the address of the location. Okay, so I'm going to go back, go back, and now I'm going to add a test. So I'm going to hit the plus sign here to add a test, and I'll give that a name. I'm going 
gonna call that a new home test and I'm gonna pick which test I'm gonna do I'm gonna do a ResNet multi-point test and then I'm gonna run the test so down on the lower left there click run test okay now it can it can see my gauge um, up here we can see connect so I'm going to touch that okay now it's doing it's monitoring so it it can see the gauge and it's gonna um, and we've got a model 3 fan we're gonna use the uh, ring B on it And we're doing a depressurization test. So I'm going to go start test on the lower left corner here. Start test. It's going to ask for indoor and outdoor temperature. And it brought in the elevation for our test from that from that location. So it brought in that. Uh, that information right into our test. The fan is capped, so I'm going to continue with the baseline. Now on the status bar, we can see that it's measuring, it's measuring our baseline. Okay, baseline in, uncapped fan, so I'm going to go and cap it. Continue. We've got ring B set. Okay. Now it adjusted our fan pressure to 60. And we can see it's sampling data at 60. Adjusting the fan down to 48. Sampling data. Okay, next is 35. Adjusting, uh, we can see on our green status bar there, it's adjusting the fan for 35 and it's doing an auto zero and then um, sampling for data. It's a pretty calm day today, so I set the fan adjust rate up to make this go a little quicker. On windier days, you'll have to, you'll have to back off that fan adjust rate some. Auto zeroing. But you can see on a you know if it's a fairly calm day, you can you can step through these, um, step through these numbers pretty quickly. Now we're adjusting down to ten pascals. Looks like we're gonna be able to get that data okay. Now, so it completed the test and it's asking if we want to view the report. So we'll say yes. So there's a, there's a copy of what our, our report looks like. Um, so it's got the testing company name, the um, technician's name and his credentials and email address, the uh, uh, building information, your customer, whoever your customer is, his information, longitude, latitude, timestamp, and um, CFM 50. So there we go. That's that's the number we're interested in. This is a, a graph of our five data points. They're all fitting on the line really well. So we can see that um, we can see that by looking at our correlation 
Uh, coefficient is 0.999. We want that to be below 0.99. And, and our coefficient and exponent, our building curve information. I could also enter the volume um, in here, um, it, and then it would it would um, include an air change per hour in the report if I entered the volume in here. If I'm doing this test for code compliance, I, I could I could choose that, and I could choose the the target number if I'm shooting for three air changes per hour. Then where this measured leakage is, the bold, you know, front and center bold number here would be the target, um, the target air changes per hour, what the air changes per hour actually was, and and pass or fail. So it would have uh, would have all that info in there. So it's it's as simple as that. So now if I if I wanted to, so I'm going to click done up here and now I'm going to go back to uh, um, to the um, projects I'm going to go back to the project screen okay so now you can see the it, it's it uh, sorted in alphabetical order so it's showing best homes so if I do another test for best homes here if I'm doing another test for them I can click on this icon over on the far right here and that'll make a copy um, of that so then that will bring over all of the uh, best homes um, um, address and that company information and then I can use the location finder to populate the um, um, populate the the address field of the house and um, I've already chosen what tests I do on that house and it copied all that information, that the type of tests I did uh, over also. And um, um, I'll just need to change the, the volume and square footage of the house. And, and uh, so it makes it really simple to generate a report. And then, um, and then you can email, you can easily email that PDF report um, from, um, from, the, from your homepage also, or from the testing page. So when it, when it pulled up that report, it said, "Did you want to view the report um, from that screen?" I could, I could send, I could email that report off. So we already showed when we did that test the multi-point ResNet non-code report. So there's three other reports we'll show you. Okay, this first one is um, is a single point test. So we just did a CFM 50 and um, it doesn't have a, a target number. So it's just gonna in bold in the middle here. It'll just show what our, what our CFM 50 was. And we can see it was just a single point, just one, one point at 50. And then, you know, the data we took and our, our uh, gauge and our um, calibration date from that gauge, etc. Um, shows up on there also. Okay, so that's what that report looks like. And the next one is a, so this again is a, is just a single point test, but, but we did this um, so it would have a leakage target and a pass fail criteria. So if you're, if you're, um, if your code compliance allows you to do just a single point test, it, you know, as you saw, it wouldn't take much longer to do a multi-point test than a single point and you'd have better data. But you could do a CFM at 50 and have the air change per hour um, show up on a report. You could, could set it up that way. And then the last one is a, a multi-point test. So this is following the E779 standard and that's required for the 2015 and 2018 code. Um, so if you wanted to follow that, that E779 standard, um, you, could, you could do that. And we're just doing a, a depressurization test and um, it shows the, the pass or fail um, right on the front there. And then the additional information of the, the coefficient and the exponent and the correlation coefficient and um, and the measured CFM 
at 50 and then you know the multi-point this was an eight point test e779 is eight data points from 60 to 18 so a little bit different than the resnet that goes 60 all the way down to 10 with five points um, so a little bit additional data for this one but you, you know you certainly would get very similar results so that's those are the options of some test standards and another thing to, that that you can do is you can you can download on your phone or your tablet uh, a PDF reader so these are all PDF files uh, a PDF reader that allow you to sign it so if your building official requires you to sign um, your document you can open it up uh, and, and sign it and then email it off email off a signed copy right right from the house um, or if you you know you can you can send it and then if you don't have internet access at the house when you do or um, cell coverage whenever you get into an area with cell coverage you can uh, you can send it out then so those are some of the different reports if you do a multi-point test we t I talked a little bit about that additional information, but we'll go into it in a little more detail. So you get accuracy and repeatability. You can see the plus or minus of you know accuracy and the, the correlation coefficient, um, what the repeatability of that test are. So you know as soon as you do the test, you've got good data, you've got a good test. You also have that building leakage curve information. So the um, CFM 50 equals C times a pressure raised to a power. That C is referred to as the correlation coefficient, and that is actually the C is the, uh, the flow at one Pascal, and the N is the exponent. And that's typically, it's allowed to be between 0.5 and uh, 0.8, I mean, um, and one, but you'll rarely it's pretty rare that you'll see uh, an exponent, or at least it, it has been for me, to see an exponent higher than 0.8. So 0.65 is typical, uh, 0.5 to 0.8 is kind of the range um, that you would typically see. So um, this, and the correlation coefficient, point, you know, 0.99 or better. 0.999 is really good. <laughs> um, and you can, you can increase the time averaging period so um, before you start the test, you know, you've got everything set up. You, you can um, you get into the, that page that allows you to, to adjust the, the time averaging period, and you can make that longer, and that'll, that'll in, help increase that correlation coefficient. And if you have any questions about any of these things, feel free to give me a call or email me, and I can, I can help you through um, doing any of these things. So having that that C and the N that shows up on your report allows you to calculate the flow at any pressure. So if you wanted to calculate, so you, you have the C, you have the N, those are given to you on the multipoint report. If you wanna know what the, the flow is at five Pascals, just put five Pascals in here. Um, C times five raised to the, to the 0.65, let's say. Um, you need a scientific calculator to do that. Um, we'll give you the flow at that pressure. Or you could set it up this way in a spreadsheet and just enter the pressure and it'll it'll do the calculation for you. So, you know, if you turn on a closed dryer and uh, it changes the pressure in the house by five pascals, you can, you can tell what the flow is. So uh, test results, um, you'll get an uh, air leakage at 50 pascals, which is what we're most interested. And you could, um, you know, we, we showed uh, an air change per hour. Um, and the formula to calculate air change per hour is the CFM at 50 results times 60, because you're converting um, air changes per hour to air changes per minute, and there's 60 minutes in an hour. So your CFM 50 times 60 divided by the volume. That's what air changes per hour is. And, and some standards um, um, will look at CFM per, per square foot of enclosure, and that's really a better, um, that's a better metric to use because air leakage occurs on the, uh, through the holes in the envelope, right? Through the holes in the enclosure. 
so uh, it, it makes most sense um, to use CFM per square foot of enclosure instead of air change per hour. Uh, air change per hour penalizes uh, small volume buildings. Um, there's not a, uh, a linear correlation between um, square foot of enclosure area and, and volume. And it really, um, uh, if air changes per hour is, uh, is the metric you're using, you'll find it's harder, you know, slab on grade, um, smaller homes are, are much harder to meet three air changes per hour. Um, a better metric would be CFM per square foot of enclosure. And so far for residential applications, only the state of New York in, um, in a multifamily unit, seven units or larger, will allow that CFM per square foot of enclosure area as a, as a target. And I think 0.3 was the number. CFM per square foot of enclosure area. The air density correction becomes important, uh, especially if you're in a climate like ours or we have extreme conditions where we can get below zero. Um, you, can, you can have more than a 10% a, a uh, density correction. So it becomes important, especially for code compliance, to include that and um, um, temperature difference and elevation are the two things considered in um, in that air density correction and uh, the the software and apps do that so that's helpful uh, issues affecting calibration um, the fans maintain calibration unless damage has occurred so a damaged flow sensor is one part of it and the blower door motor position is the other so the motor position you can see on the sketch we put a straight edge across the fan housing with the rings off and measure the distance between the flow sensor and that. And it should be a quarter inch plus or minus a sixteenth. So from three sixteenths to five sixteenths is what that distance should be. So if your motor is shifted, um, you'll need to get it back into alignment. You may need to um, um, uh, send that in for repair to, to get that done. And then the flow sensor, you know, you can connect a tube to the tap. Um, um, suck on it and it should hold a vacuum and you can check for that by it should stick to your tongue for a couple of seconds uh, Showing that it's holding a vacuum if it doesn't um, The way I troubleshoot it is this here's a flow sensor and there's a tube coming off of that And then there's a 90 degree turn that's barbed you can unplug that tube going to the flow sensor and um, that that tube is part of the flow sensor, so that shouldn't be coming out, shouldn't be loose, you shouldn't be able to pull it out. Um, you can disconnect it and do that test again on just the flow sensor part. And if that fails, you'll need to get a new flow sensor. If that passes, then it's something in the other tubing connection. And to get at, um, to replace that tube, you'll need to um, take the electrical box off of the top. There's four screws that are holding the handle on. If you take those four screws up, you can get at that tap and replace that that other piece of tubing. So those are the things that, that you need to check periodically to make sure your fan is still within that calibration range. Um, we do do a custom calibration for the Army Corps of Engineers. They're the only ones that I'm aware of that, that requires uh, a blow our fan calibration, um, but uh, we don't we don't recommend that for for regular blow our testing because it stays within the calibration range unless um, unless some damage has been uh, occurring. Upstream conditions can also affect fan calibration. So if you have a blow our setup and within four feet of the inlet side, the side with the rings on, if there's a, a wall there or some furniture there that can affect um, conditions uh, um, and, and that can affect your readings. And where you'll see that is if you do a, a multi-point blower dart test and you switch rings in the middle of it and, and you can see there's two distinct lines when you, when you switch rings, um, that's typically caused by something like this where, where when you add a ring, um, you get you don't get everything lining up on a line. There are two distinct lines. It, that's usually um, what the cause is. So, for example, if you set up a, you have a, 
um, a house with a basement and you have a side entrance that's right at the top of the stairs so maybe you you can go from that landing you go up three stairs into the house and, and down eight stairs into the basement and the air is coming up the stairway and going into the fan if you switch from open position to ring a um, you might see uh, a problem with those upstream conditions because you've got you know the air is changing direction or c coming from a, a weird angle um, it's it's making a bend and turning into the and um, and you've got uneven pressures and in, in flows or uneven um, flow streams going across the opening of the fan uh, high back pressure can also be an issue um, you can go up to 80 pascals of back pressure with with the model 3 fan so you won't you won't be testing at at pressures that high uh, but if you're an example of a high back pressure is if you're blowing air into um, a porch for example and uh, windows are closed in that porch or there's not enough opening to the outside and you could be pressurizing that porch when you're blowing air out of the house and you know you might have 20 pascals or 30 pascals in that room and and um, 60 pascals in the house and you might might go over that range so back pressure um, will affect the the calibration and your results also finding air leaks um, using the back of your hand when depressurizing um, i know a couple of guys that that uh, they you know they started out just doing blow or guided air sealing and, and they got really good at that and and that's what they don't uh, typically use a smoke puffer or will use it rarely they're used to using just just their hand for using your hand for feeling the um, the airflow currents um, smoke puffers work great um, also for for finding finding air movement using an infrared camera i mean that is that's the gold standard that's what most people are doing now um, they're not twenty thousand dollars anymore. You can get a pretty good quality one for for uh, close to two to three thousand. Uh, a good quality one that that meets the ResNet standards. That's good enough to do this kind of diagnostic work. So using an infrared camera to find where the leaks are. So you'll do a scan with the um, with the blower before you run the blower door, and then do another scan with the blower door running and look at the th the difference between those two and and that's that's uh, air leakage. Um, zone pressure diagnostics. You know we could do a half day training on zone pressure diagnostics, but uh, measuring pressures in in unconditioned spaces. Um, tells you some information about leakage house to zone and leakage zoned outside and doing the add a hole or open a door um, and entering that into software uh, gets you a lot of different additional information. So pressure pans are used to help find duct leaks. So you cover the registers one at a time with the blower door at 50 and the air handler off and the um, um, duct with the highest pressure um, tells you where the, the one that's closest to the biggest leak. So the, a duct leakage test doesn't tell you where the leaks are, but a pressure pan used with a blower door um, does tell you good information about where the leaks are. Pressure matching uh, with a kitchen fan. So you turn on the kitchen fan, measure the pressure housed outside, and then turn the kitchen fan off, um, run the blower door up to that same pressure, and um, that can give you a, a good idea what the kitchen fan flow would be. Um, you'd wanna close the doors to make the kitchen zone as tight as you can, but the blower door fan must be in that kitchen zone. Um, turn on the kitchen fan, turn the kitchen fan off, um, match it with the blower door. You probably need ring C though, if the flow, most kitchen fans are less than 300 CFM, hopefully. <laughs> in your area and to measure below 300 CFM you'll need ring C. Okay now we'll um, we'll take time for questions and it looks like we ran over just a little bit but um, I'll uh, go through questions that have been asked so far and then we will um, take some additional questions also so go ahead and type in some more questions and uh, and we'll take some time to answer them. All right, so now we'll review um, 
we'll review some of the questions you might have. All right, we've got a few questions here. Um, how should you deal with vermiculite insulation? Certainly, if, if you're working for a program, um, they should have guidelines on how you should be dealing with vermiculite insulation. And I know either, even weatherization programs from state to state will deal with vermiculite in, in different ways. Um, the, the, the Environmental Protection Agency says if, if there's vermiculite insulation, you shouldn't disturb it. Um, there are um, um, agencies and, and um, companies that will test vermiculite insulation and to see how much asbestos it has in it. That's the concern, is some vermiculite insulations um, have asbestos in them. Um, and what that test will tell you is it less than 1%. It doesn't, won't say there's zero. Um, it'll just say if there's less than 1% um, asbestos in that vermiculite insulation. So it, it's gonna vary from, um, from agency to agency and, and um, um, there, there's lots of opinions <laughs> on, on how to deal with vermiculite insulation, but a lot of um, a lot of agencies will, you know, if you go up in the attic before you do the blow air test and, and you find vermiculite insulation, then they'll have you do a pressurization test. And pressurization tests will typically uh, almost always be higher than a depressurization test because things will blow open. For example, you know, if you have a weather strip door, it, you'll have a tendency to pull away from the weather strip during a pressurization test, or if you have um, dampers on exhaust devices like a clothes dryer or a kitchen fan or a bath fan. Um, it'll tend to blow those open during a pressurization test. So your numbers will be a little bit higher, but you know, if you're in a program where you're doing pre-tests and post-tests between air ceilings, um, it still tells you the change in, in uh, CFM. Um, so it's still, it's still certainly valid data. Um, do we have any special treatments for older naturally aspirated furnaces um, so you aren't measuring the airflow um, um, through those? Um, there, there really aren't through, I mean, a with a natural draft furnace and a natural draft water heater, as we know, once the pressure gets to a certain point in the house, it's gonna start pulling air down the chimney. And that's usually at about five pascals. The air will flow up the chimney until the pressure gets up to a certain point. Then it'll start pulling air down the chimney. And, and that's, that's a leak in the house. And that, that's a leak. <laughs> a leak is a leak. Um, and, um, you know, the main, the main thing is, is you want to be just, you know, um, seeing the change in, in tightness um, you know, I, I've even heard of people who go from a, a natural draft furnace and water heater to direct vent or power vent, and they start noticing moisture problems because that, that vent is acting like an exhaust fan, right? There's always, even when the furnace isn't running, there's a certain amount of air going up the chimney all the time, you know, and that might be 30, 20 or 30 CFM of continuous ventilation through that vent. So it really is a leak. Um, what what would be an application for ring E? Um, you know, if you're if you're testing if you're testing um, um, small apartment units and you're doing a multi-point test, um, when you're testing at 10 pascals, you you might have a reading of of less than um, 30 or 40 CFM, or you you might need a ring E. Um, so that's there are there are. Our, our German distributor, we send all the rings. They, they want all the rings for every fan because they are getting um, houses tight enough so they, and they need, they need the smaller rings often enough that ring C, D, and E come, to, come with all the, our board, our systems. Um, okay, another question um, at prep before starting. Um, 
when we talked about dimension openings and crawl space access, okay? The question is if you have, you know, sometimes you'll have, um, you'll have a crawl space that's, that's got a dirt floor that's, that's under a, a porch addition or an addition or something like that. Um, and um, there might be some, some ventilation to it. Um, should, you, should you still open the access? I, I would always recommend opening an access in a crawl space to the outside during a test. So then you're, you're getting, um, you, you know, you're really trying to measure uh, what, how much air is flowing across the leaks at 50 pascals. That's kind of the goal of the test. And anytime you can, you can open the test to allow that, um, I would recommend, I would certainly recommend doing that. There, there are exceptions. Um, and, and one exception would be in the ResNet standard, um, they call for an overhead garage door to be closed during, during the blower door test. So if you're following a test standard um, then, then you'll want to uh, do what that test standard says. You'll want to make yourself familiar. And ResNet does have, have the um, most extensive guidelines on setting up a house for a test. So if you don't already, aren't already following a guideline and you've got a lot of people working for your agency, that is a good way to make sure everybody's setting up the house the same way, is to follow, follow a written standard. Either either have your own internal standard that people are using, or or follow an established standard um, for how to set up the house, and that that will help guide you. And um, if there's something unique in your area that you need to add to that list, then then you can certainly do that. If CFM is still high, where to check before blowing insulation? Um, certainly, the standard attic bypasses um, are. are are typically pretty easy to find. You know, recess lights, uh, drop soffits, um, openings around plumbing vents, and and um, and chimney chimney bypasses. Um, th those are pretty easy. But sometimes um, top plates can be really leaky, uh, and that will definitely show up with an infrared camera. Um, sometimes all the top plates are leaking a lot, and you go up and push away the insulation from the top plate, and you see that that when they nailed the sheetrock, and the, the, it would be more, more in a sheetrock house than other types, but when they nailed the sheetrock, um, they only nailed it every 16 inches and they didn't nail it to the top plate. So between studs, there's a big enough space where you could drop a dime down between the sheetrock and the top plate. There's a gap there. And um, if that's consistent all the way around the whole house, that, that adds up to be a pretty big leak. <laughs> when you add up all those tiny leaks and, and it's worth air sealing the top plates in those cases. Um, um, penetrations from, um, uh, penetrations from electrical wires and cable wiring, things like that are another big one. Um, if, if you have the luxury of living in a cold climate like ours, <laughs> And you can bring the infrared camera up into the attic. And, it, you know, when you've got blown fiberglass insulation, you can really easily find air leaks that way. You, you don't want to get your camera lens all dirty, but you want to take some precautions. But in, especially in multifamily buildings um, with huge open attics, that those attic bypasses just pop. Um, let's see. I have a DG700, how out of date is it? <laughs> um, we, we will continue repairing and calibrating um, DG700s as, as long as we have parts. There are some parts um, we will be running out of within, within the next couple of years. Um, you know, if you've got something like a, like a board that's gone bad, uh, the repair is, is high enough where it wouldn't be worth fixing. Um, you, uh, it, it kind of depends on how you use the gauge. If, if you want to use the apps um, to generate reports, if you need to generate a report as part of your, your, your job, the, the DG1000 is, is the way to go because you can con connect with Wi-Fi and, and um, generate, generate a report 
uh, using, using our mobile apps. We do still have PC software if you've got a PC computer in the field, but we're, um, we're not gonna make any changes to those. Um, so those will, will stay the same and you can certainly continue using those. Um, kitchen zone again, you, you don't have to set up um, the blower door in a kitchen zone. I talked about that for measuring a kitchen fan. Um, you can set up, just leave your blower door where, where it regularly is set up. And if, if the kitchen fan depressurizes the house by two or three pascals, then you can just run the test that way. If it only depressurizes the house by half a pascal, and you can, you can make that kitchen a separate zone and set up your, your blower door fan, um, if there's a kitchen door to the outside, you'd set it up there. Otherwise, set up. You, you do need to be able to compartmentalize that kitchen zone into a smaller zone. Um, it, with big open floor plans, that's not necessarily a case. So all you may be able to do is close the basement door and close the door to the second floor if there is one to make that kitchen zone smaller. Yeah, and that will... Um, give you a, a higher depressurization number and, um, and you can get more um, better resolution on your results, more accurate results. Um, elevation, tower, huh. interesting. On a, on a tall building, when you're measuring um, unit by unit, do you use the elevation of the, um, the floor you're on or the elevation at grade. And um, it's really not gonna make much of a difference in your results. In fact, the old ResNet, the old ResNet standard used to say you didn't have, you didn't have to make that, that elevation correction at all um, unless you're above 3,000 feet of elevation. So, you know, it's just a couple of percent change if you're at 3,000 feet. So if we're talking hundreds of feet, it's not going to make much of a difference in, um, in the number you enter in. So I would just use the, the elevation at ground. Multi-fan setup, multi-family testing. Um, we do have we do have um, um, webinars on commercial building testing and multifamily testing on our website. Um, that's that's kind of a whole nother uh, webinar, and and we do have webinars on using TechLog. Um, we've got a four-part webinar series that we recorded. I think it was 2015, um, and so that doesn't talk about the DG1000 and how you would make. The connections to a computer, but it still shows you um, the basic use of tech log hasn't changed. So it's a four part series. Each part is an hour and it starts out using tech log for measuring pressures and then gets into single family testing and then multifamily and commercial. So um, um, it's worth viewing those and, and doing some practice with it in between. To, to get familiar with it with any software. It's not an automated test. It's, it's, um, it's got uh, more flexibility on, on, uh, because it's got a graph where you can visually see the pressures and flows. You can choose um, taking data when, when pressures have stabilized. Um, so, um, so yeah, check out our website and check out TechLog. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to give me a call and I can help talk you through any questions you might have about that software. Why would opening up um, doors to unconditioned spaces be helpful? It, you know, when you think about it, you're, you're trying to, you're trying to, um, you're trying to learn what the leakiness of the house is at, at 50 Pascal. So if you're measuring 50 Pascals across each leak, it's going to give you a, a, a better sense of where the leaks are in a building. Um, so you, you know, you want to make that building as tight as you can. Um, and you know, what, what you will notice <clears throat> if you've got a lot of leaks between a house and an attic, 
and, and you add roof vents, um, your blower door number will go up quite a bit. If you add three or four roof vents to a roof and there's a lot of leaks between the house and the attic. Um, so, you know, those things change over time. Venting gets added and now your, your house is leakier. You, you miss those leaks um, because you didn't have a full 50 pascals uh, of pressure. You, you overlooked the, the um, um, you know, kind of uh, some, some of the potential for air sealing. Um, and, and it may have been fairly easy uh, air sealing to get at um, before, the, before things are insulated. Um, pressure pan, what's the purpose? Um, so when there are some, some uses for a pressure pan while doing a blower door test, besides just using a pressure pan for finding leaks in the ductwork. Um, its primary reason, um, the reason we created it was for finding duct leaks. So you're just, you have the house at 50 pascals during your blower door test. You put the pressure pan over a register one at a time and write down the numbers you get and the highest numbers are closest to the biggest leaks. That, that was a primary use. Um, some other uses for the pressure pan is if you have a, a drop soffit area and, um, and you suspect that that's open to the attic above, there's no seal across the top of that drop soffit in the attic, and there's an outlet on a wall, you can put that pressure pan across the outlet, over the outlet, and what that really tells you is what's the pressure in that wall. So if you take that measurement with a pressure pan and then stack, stick a metal probe along the side of that electrical box into that wall opening, you'll find that those numbers are very similar. So you're measuring the pressure in the wall in an easy way. That's basically what you're doing. And if that, that pressure in the wall is very similar to the pressure in the attic, then you know there's an interconnection between there. So that's, that's helpful. Um, one thing it's not helpful for is if you put that pressure pan on an exterior wall that you know is not open to the attic, that's not really telling you anything. Or if you use a pressure pan over a recessed light. So that's, that's one instance where it's a very, fairly common misuse of a pressure pan is, is um, trying, to tell you, trying to tell how many CFM flow are moving through that recessed light um, by putting a pressure pan over it. It's not measuring airflow. Um, it, it's essentially measuring what the pressure is either in the attic or inside that can. So it's not, it's really not telling you, using it as a pass fail, um, that uh, pressure pan number over a recess light is, is not, um, not the proper use of it. You'd have to have a hole, you'd have to have a hole in that you know, and be able to measure airflow for that to be the useful um, um, something similar to a pressure pan. I mean, um, exhaust fan flow meter only a much smaller hole. Um, zoning for an attic or open the attic access to begin with. You could do it either way. So the question is when you're doing zonal testing where you're, you're um, opening the attic hatch. Um, you're going to do a blower door, measure the pressure in the attic with the blower door running and the door closed, and then do another blower door test um, and measure the pressure in the attic with the, with the attic access open. And you could do it either way. You could either um, do it with the attic cap open first or with the attic hatch closed first. How often do we recommend uh, calibrating the DG1000? Um, we're saying two years, and once we have more data, we may we may change that out longer. Um, we we just don't know. Um, we'll know once we get more data, but but right now we're leaving the recommendation the same as with the DG seven hundred. Okay, well that that concludes our our question and answer session. Thanks for attending. And, and we do appreciate uh, any feedback you have and also recommendations on, on future webinars. We're always looking for, uh, for new ideas on new webinars. Thank you.